Now, Carnegie admonished his peers, the man who dies thus rich dies disgraced. It is the duty of the wealthy, Carnegie declared in his article, to consider all surplus revenues which come to him simply as trust funds, to do what, in his judgment, is best for the community. The wealthy capitalist is thus a mere trustee and agent for his poor brethren, bringing to their service his superior wisdom, experience, and ability to administer. In a word, doing for them better than they would or could do for themselves. He then recommended to men and women of the substantial means seven uses for their surplus wealth, declaring the priorities that he followed in the years to come. Topping the list were universities, to which Carnegie gave more than $20 million in his lifetime. Next were free public libraries, which, to Carnegie's mind, squared with his goal to stimulate the best and most aspiring poor of the community to further efforts for their own improvement. Carnegie contributed 2,811 libraries to communities that promised to support them. This most famous of his philanthropies consumed more than $60 million of his wealth. Carnegie also recommended giving money for medical institutions, public parks, and city beautification halls for concerts, of elevating music and enlightening lectures, swimming baths, and less church buildings. Carnegie's round face glowed and his eyes sparkled as he received the adulation of wealthy admirers and fawning supplicants. Gladstone sanctified Carnegie's proposals with a review of his article in the prestigious British magazine, 19th Century, criticizing only Carnegie's condemnation of inherited wealth. From his celebrated position, Carnegie dismissed the critical reviews of his article. The Reverend Hugh Price Hughes, a prominent Methodist minister and Christian populist, condemned this new gospel of wealth as it had become to be called Mr. Carnegie's progress is accompanied by the growing poverty, poverty of his less fortunate fellow countrymen, he wrote. William Jewett Tucker, a uh, liberal, theo theologian, <laughs> a liberal theologian and later president of Dartmouth College, pointed out that the assumption that wealth is the inevitable possession of the few and is best administered by them for by the many, or for the many, begs the whole question of economic justice now before society. I can conceive of no greater mistake, Tucker protested, than that of trying to make charity do the work of justice. Carnegie's never aimed at justice. His goal was to lead people upward. Like his politics, Carnegie's philanthropy was a mixture of moralistic programs to civilize the masses, impulsive decisions, and sentimentality. Libraries, institutes, concert halls, and church organs, 7,689 organs, costing more than $6 million, were given to uplift the poor and working classes, as if they would rather prefer, prefer organs over food um, or job. Um, in, 1904, in 1904, he provided more than $10 million for Carnegie Hero Fund to honor men and women who are injured or killed while trying to save their fellows. Medals were presented to be the hero or his or her surviving family, and occasionally monetary grants to encourage the masses to follow examples set by the heroes of civilization. Carnegie also provided his birthplace of uh, Dunford Firmaline, Scotland, with $3.75 million fund for parks, recreation, and general beautification. Reverend Gates introduces Rockefeller to wholesale philanthropy. Like Carnegie, John Davison Rockefeller's interest in financial benevolence antedates its most famous philanthropies. From the time of his youth, Rockefeller's life consisted of work, family and the Baptist Church. More like his pious mother than his genial and impulsive father, Rockefeller lived a disciplined life, forever pinching pennies, but mindful of his Christian duties. Even in 1855, 
when he was earning $3.50 a week as a clerk accountant in Cleveland, Rockefeller carefully apportioned about 10% of his income to charities and church work. His philanthropy grew with his riches. By 1881, he was giving away more than $60,000 a year. By the end of the century, he and Carnegie were competing in their philanthropy with Carnegie ahead. Uh, just as a side note on that, when, you know, the author states he's giving this money away, which technically is, but you know, they're not doing it necessarily out of the goodness of their heart, although there is an aspect to that. Uh, you know, you're giving these away, but you also get tax benefits for that uh, in society. And also it creates a power base um, that which you can use to wield more power uh, into the future. Um, but it's kind of framed as if, you know, he's he's like, a, you know, a saint giving away his money out of the goodness of his heart. And, you know, as we'll find out through the book, that's not necessarily the case. Rockefeller was diligent in giving to charity, but ungenerous in spirit. Like other men of his day, climbing the ladders of business success and those who had reached the top, Rockefeller saw no excuse for poverty. Having gone into business for himself and at the age of 20, the oil king knew that hard work and disciplined living were the means to escape poverty. And in 1887, Rockefeller answered a poor young man's plea for $50 with a check, a request for an IOU and a warning. Quote, it will be injurious for him to receive from others what he can in any way secure for himself by his own efforts, end quote. And after a visit to a house of industry in New York's incom incom incomparable slum of five points, he complained that although the institution gave free meals to the area's tramps only on Thanksgiving Day, he would give them work and make them earn their food. Whereas Carnegie's secular views led him to social Darwinism as a biological and social explanation for the maldistribution of wealth, Rockefeller's religion exercised all self-doubts, particularly as he grew older and more comfortable with his fortune and his role as philanthropist. Rockefeller came to believe that God gave me my money. When he uttered these words in 1905, Rockefeller was not the most revered name in North America. He thus felt called upon to explain, quote, I believe the power to make money is a gift from God to, to be developed and used to the best of our ability for the good of mankind. I believe it is my duty to make money and steal more money and to use the money I make for the good of my fellow man, according to the dictates of my conscience. Rockefeller's conscience led him to heap great benevolence on a wide range of socially uplifting charities. Andrew Carnegie put churches last on his list of recommended philanthropies, but for Rockefeller, the Baptist Church and its numerous charities and missions were the highest priority. Hospitals and other public welfare charities were also favorites. He hoped his contributions would enable the denomination to lead all people to live with rectitude and to aid the fallen poor to gain their proper path. In 1890, Rockefeller's contributions to charities and colleges topped $300,000, and the next year, a half million dollars. But in 1889, one month before Carnegie published the first of his two-part Gospel of Wealth, Rockefeller committed himself to a particularly ambitious philanthropic project and a relationship with a man who was to write a new chapter in philanthropy. For several years, a group of Baptists in the East and another group in the West had been trying to develop a new seminary and university for the denomination. The Eastern group wanted the institution to be located in New York, while the other group desperately hoped to develop it in Chicago, the rapidly growing metropolis of the nation's westward expansion. Both groups were pressing Rockefeller, the richest Baptist in the world, to contribute the millions needed to endow the first-rate institution. While interested in such a project, Rockefeller was not swayed by the emotionalism of either group's appeal. The struggling 
academies, seminaries, and colleges of the denomination met in Washington in 1888 to form the American Baptist Education Society to raise money for Baptist education and to coordinate its development. They named the fast-rising Reverend Frederick T. Gates Executive Secretary, a position from which he leaped to the pinnacle of both philanthropic and corporate power. Gates immediately conducted a survey of Baptist educational needs throughout the country. Armed with his data, he wrote a detailed and eloquent report. Gates demonstrated that nearly half of the country's Baptists live in west, lived west of Pennsylvania and north of the Ohio River, but that the denomination's educational facilities in this region were practically worthless. He concluded that a new Baptist university should be built on the ruins of the old University of Chicago, a weak and by then bankrupt denominational institution. While the new university should bring together the most capable specialists in both its classical and scientific departments, it must be an institution wholly under Baptist control and chartered right loyal to Christ, his church, employing none but Christians in any department of instruction, a school not only evangelical, but evangelistic. Gates's report was the turning port it was the turning point in the denomination's campaign for a university. As he himself put it, quote, the brothers were all torn up over it. The Chicago proponents coalesced around the report, and the dwindling supporters of the New York location became even more emotional in their desperate appeals to Rockefeller. The Education Society Executive Board unanimously approved the proposal at the December 1888 meeting. Within six months, Gates won Rockefeller's approval and an initial gift of $600,000 that soon became a torrent of support, totaling $35 million in the next 21 years. Rockefeller was so impressed with Gates that he wrote University of Chicago President Harper in 1889, quote, I have made up my mind to act in my educational benefactions through the American Baptist Education Society, end quote. Rockefeller, worn out by his total immersion in business since the age of 20, was a physical wreck as he entered in his 50s in 1889. He suffered increasingly from nervous fatigue and stomach ailments. He soon lost all his hair, including his eyebrows, because of a nervous disease, generalized alopecia. His doctors had warned him to reduce his activities as much as possible, but his responsibilities were mounting. Although Standard Oil was now in the hands of experienced and trusted lieutenants, there was an increasing flow of requests for large and small portions of his wealth from churches, missionary societies, hospitals, colleges, charity organizations, and individuals, once running as high as 50,000 requests in a single month. In 